Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me here. It is uh, uh, a big honor to present uh, to you a great community of Fairbanks uh, some uh, results or information of work uh, which we are uh, gathering this information at the Permafrost Lab at the Geophysical Institute. And um, I will start with the... Uh, um, so uh, this information, what I will be talking about, is really a result of work of many, many scientists. Uh, first of all, our Permafrost Lab at the Geophysical Institute, uh, our university, which is uh, truly international. We have uh, scientists and students from the United States, from Russia, from Western Europe, from uh, also from Asia. And also, uh, in my presentation, I will use materials for much more uh, many scientists, uh, our colleagues from, from uh, North America and international colleagues. So this is kind of a, a presentation which will uh, show some uh, some results of our work, uh, mostly related to changes in permafrost uh, temperatures, but with some applications. What does these changes uh, uh, do? That these changes mean for uh, for permafrost and for the Arctic. So first of all, uh, I would uh, like to uh, okay. I will use cursor to oops, sorry. Uh, to point, because uh, we have three screens, so it's, it will be difficult to use uh, a, a pointer. So first of all, a couple of words, what uh, basic definitions. So what is uh, permafrost? By the most common definition, and this is the map of permafrost distribution in Northern Hemisphere, uh, the latest available map of 1997. And by um, the most common definition of permafrost based on, on temperature. So it says, any earth material under uh, ground surface with uh, at or below uh, zero degrees cel Celsius temperature is permafrost. So pretty much any material which uh, for two or more years. So you need uh, two or more years of uh, temperature below zero to call this material uh, permafrost. And we don't say that uh, uh, glaciers or, or uh, multi-year uh, sea ice is permafrost. No, it, it's not our sphere. So what we are uh, talking about is material which is below the ground surface. And uh, permafrost um, is product of cold climates. And you can see it from this map that most of the permafrost is uh, in high latitudes. And high latitudes and cold climates and also um, is uh, in high elevations. So for example, in Tibet Plateau in uh, uh, China here. Um, it's low latitudes, but high elevation. So cold climate develop uh, right conditions to permafrost to exist. And of course, when climate change, permafrost also react to these changes because it is product of cold climates. And in permafrost, uh, if you look uh, at its colors, uh, we distinguish between continuous permafrost, which is farther north, and discontinuous permafrost in the south. And on this map, all uh, uh, blue colors is continuous permafrost, and all other co colors are uh, discontinuous permafrost. Uh, there is also interesting feature like subsea permafrost. Unfortunately, I don't have too much time to talk about it, but it's a very interesting object as well. So what is uh, really interesting um, uh, and one of the most uh, exciting feature of permafrost, of course, is ice in it. So uh, it changes all properties when ice turns into water. That's why it's so exciting to uh, look uh, how permafrost ch changes uh, with, uh, with changes in, in climate and other conditions. So this is one of these examples. It, it may be some a little bit extreme example where all this glancing, uh, uh, all this. Uh, light color material is ice. And frozen soil is just in between. So uh, by volume, at uh, this kind of permafrost, you will have much more ice than, than, uh, than soil uh, or ground, which is frozen as, as well and also has some, some ice in it. So uh, the ice make permafrost is so uh, special 
and so vulnerable to changes. You can imagine if uh, you have something built on this kind of permafrost, what will happen to this, this uh, um, anything that is on top of it if uh, this permafrost will thaw and ice will melt. So um, also another fe uh, interesting feature is that uh, most of the ice, most of the, uh, we call it massive ice uh, in permafrost, is formed as uh, ice wedges. Uh, there's not only ice wedges which uh, represent this massive ice. There are some other ones, like pingo ice and other ones. But the ice wedges, which is, uh, you can see them on both uh, pictures here, uh, and, and taken from the same place in Siberia. So the ice wedges form this kind of uh, polygonal structure uh, on the top figure, this one, which uh, uh, will be important to understand what is going, what will be going on with permafrost when it will be thawing. And later in my uh, presentation, I will show some results when this kind of uh, permafrost is thawing and ice wedges are, are melting. So that's uh, uh, kind of uh, remember this picture for the future discussion. And the uh, lower part represents the same cliff, but you can see and uh, this ice wedges really form this uh, kind of vertical bodies of ice, which could be several meters uh, in width and many, many meters in depth, up to uh, 20, 30, uh, 40 meters, so more than 100 feet uh, of ice. So uh, permafrost could be really, really icy. Uh, in going to Alaska, uh, and this is the uh, latest uh, permafrost map which we developed uh, towards the, the conference, the permafrost conference, which we uh, had in uh, 2008 here in Fairbanks. Uh, so this is the latest map showing the, uh, again, distribution of permafrost continuous in, in the north and discontinuous and sporadic in the south. And you can see that uh, most of Alaska is covered uh, or under, uh, affected by permafrost. So just only some very uh, uh, narrow belt in the south, uh, southwest, central, south, central, and south uh, east are free of permafrost. Most of uh, area in Alaska affected by permafrost. Um, and this is kind of diagram I borrowed from uh, USGS, um, uh, kind of showing that uh, continuity of permafrost, continuous permafrost in the north on the left, uh, and permafrost could be as cold in Alaska as minus 10 degrees and as thick as uh, more than 600 meters, so more than 2,000 feet in thickness in the uh, Prudhoe Bay area. And then going towards uh, Fairbanks and, and, and farther down south, uh, permafrost change from continuous to discontinuous. Uh, and in Fairbanks area, permafrost is still uh, present uh, in large amounts, so more than 50% of area is affected by permafrost uh, or underlined by permafrost in Fairbanks area. And then going farther south, uh, the thickness of permafrost in uh, Fairbanks area, typical one, around 50 meters, 150 feet on, on average, but it varies from uh, just few tens of meters or even less. Uh, and more than 100 meters in thickness. And then going down south, we start to see some islands of permafrost only, which uh, survived for some reason. Uh, well, we pretty much know for what reason, but uh, it's much less common than area without permafrost. And that we call sporadic or island permafrost. So that's kind of basic definitions. And uh, with these definitions, we'll, we'll proceed to the uh, main topic. What I will uh, present will be, first I will go back a little bit in the history and uh, explain uh, how recent permafrost formed or, or the major features of recent permafrost and, and major amount of ice in the upper permafrost, how it formed and uh, uh, to understand better the uh, properties of permafrost we have to go a little bit back because it is geological uh, kind of uh, creature permafrost. Uh, so we will, uh, I will discuss this, uh, how this amount of ice got into permafrost uh, a little bit. And then we will proceed to present day and see how during this period of time permafrost changed in the northern hemisphere. And then we will look at the present state of permafrost. Is it stable still or, or there are some kind of problems with it? And then 
we will speculate a little bit, uh, for, and uh, I will show some results of some modeling efforts, uh, which could be uh, the uh, possible scenario of changes in permafrost in the future in, uh, in Alaska uh, for the next, uh, this current uh, century. And then we will talk a little bit about what does it mean uh, for uh, Alaska and for, uh, for the north uh, changes in permafrost. Again, I will bring some examples. Uh, I cannot cover all this topic, it's huge, but some examples uh, I will show you. And I hope you, you, will, you will appreciate it. So, uh, again, coming back to definition, so permafrost is product of cold climate. That's why any changes in climate will affect permafrost. And looking back, uh, so here is several uh, scales of changes of, of climate. So the upper, uh, upper graph is uh, this 100,000 year cycle, uh, glacial, uh, interglacial cycle, big cycles, so-called Milankovitch cycles in climate, which develop huge amount of uh, ground ice, ice sheets and uh, other uh, forms. And then this ice will disappear and then appear again and then disappear. So at least uh, the, in this graph, it's only four cycles like this. Now. Uh, uh, about six or seven of them documented, and actually there is some records uh, in, in development right now which will uh, actually continue this cycle even farther in the back. So every roughly 100,000 years, we, have, we go from interglacial period like we are right now into glacial period, naturally. Uh, so now there's, if you look at the just last 10,000 years, uh, it was generally a warm period of time, if you look at the graph uh, on the top. But this uh, relatively warm period is so-called Hallatsen warm period. Uh, it's also uh, not homogeneous. It's also changing uh, in some shorter period of time, uh, time scale. Uh, climate is changing from colder to, to warmer, generally staying pretty, uh, pretty much warm. And the last, uh, say, 400 years, we experienced a relatively cold little ice age, and presently we have enjoyed uh, this warmer period of time. So all this uh, different time scale climate change uh, features affect permafrost. Permafrost reacts to these changes. And uh, immediate reaction of permafrost will be changes in temperature. So changes in temperature of permafrost will come very quickly, but uh, then a little bit later, with some delay, will uh, will uh, will follow changes in thickness of permafrost, distribution of permafrost. Those kind of changes they take much lo longer time than just changes in temperature. And then, uh, and that's I will I will show you in uh, uh, in some data that we collect. So uh, so now, the, what how this recent permafrost formed? So we'll start with uh, about twenty thousand years ago where permafrost, where climate was at its maximum, uh, uh, the, the, the glacial maximum, the coldest period of time during the last 100,000 years. So permafrost, uh, in this map, it shows only permafrost in the former Soviet Union because we had uh, pretty good data on it. But uh, permafrost was much widespread in that time, and all area which was not covered by uh, thick glaciers was, uh, in, in the northern hemisphere, a very significant portion of it was uh, affected by permafrost. So a uh, very good portion of Europe was under permafrost conditions. Uh, and then also in Asia, uh, all Mongolia and down in the China, uh, we have also permafrost. And Alaska was uh, mainly not glaciated. It was also all, uh, of course, uh, uh, permafrost, had all uh, permafrost conditions there. Now, with uh, uh, it's not just only widespread permafrost uh, uh, was feature of the of the of the times, but also so-called uh, mama step. Uh, so the conditions were very unique. We don't have this kind of step right now practically anywhere in the north. Uh, but what it was, it was treeless area with uh, uh, very strong winds, very high rate of uh, sedimentation. So lots of uh, sediments were were uh, deposited and very, very harsh climate conditions. And these climate conditions, um, the ice wedges were growing very rapidly. 
and uh, uh, that's where mainly where ice, the mu huge amount of ice got into the into the permafrost and the upper permafrost, which we are uh, supposed to deal right now with that. So also, uh, this uh, figure I, bother, uh, I, uh, I borrowed from, from, uh, uh, from our um, um, Museum of the North uh, University. Uh, I just came from there and just took picture. Um, also, what is interesting that during this very hard, uh, harsh period of climate, uh, there was very interesting ecosystem there with very tall grasses uh, and abundance of, of animals, grazers and, and predators. So what was another very important feature of the material which was collected, uh, uh, sedimented there, it was very, uh, uh, a huge amount of carbon was sequestered in, in that sediments. So it was not just ice, but also um, sediments with very significant portion of it is uh, in, in form of uh, remnants of, of grasses, uh, roots, stems even, and sometimes leaves. Uh, so lots of carbon was sequestered during that period of time and that permafrost which also was ice rich. So these two very important features, uh, they are very important for us to remember uh, because uh, that's lots of ice in this permafrost which was formed during that period of time and lots of carbon, these two, two things. Uh, well, uh, sometimes about 15,000 years ago, uh, the conditions were, uh, climate conditions changed, uh, well, more or less abruptly. Uh, and it's in a, in another interesting topic about ab abruptness of these changes. But for our reason, what we need to know, we start to move from very cold conditions of uh, last glaciation towards warmer conditions of uh, the Holocene. And, uh, and this graph showing different proxy data which prove this, this uh, warming uh, effect during this period of time between about 15,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago. Temperature increase was uh, very significant. In high latitudes, it, it could be as much as 10 or even more degrees Celsius, 20 degree Fahrenheit uh, changes. And of course, permafrost reacted to these changes. So as a result of this warming, by the about nine or 5,000 years ago, so-called Holocene optimum, which temperature during that period of time was uh, a little bit warmer, well, a little bit sometimes in some places by one or two degrees Celsius or four degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than it is right now. So most of permafrost disappeared from the Europe, practically all, and it was very actively thawing uh, around uh, the southern limits of permafrost. So that's where conditions of uh, this period of time. Also, uh, permafrost was formed on uh, ice shelves, which during the, uh, this cold period of time was land, because sea level was about 120, 130 meters below present day level. So all these uh, Arctic shelves were land, and the same type of icy, ice ridge and, uh, say, uh, and uh, carbon rich permafrost uh, w w uh, was uh, forming during that period of time. Now, with increase of sea level, by this time, by 5,000 years, uh, most of, the, of, uh, of this uh, ice, uh, uh, these shells were covered by ocean again, and permafrost is degrading right now, thawing. And uh, this is, this is the, the process which was very actively developing during this Holocene optimum. Um, and uh, this uh, kind of reddish colors on, on the southern part of permafrost distribution shows that permafrost disappeared from the surface, but still somewhere deeper there. And uh, blue colors, they show that permafrost was still stable. Even in this warmer period of time, permafrost survived. And in Alaska, North Slope, uh, permafrost still stable during this Holocene optimum. However, even in this stable permafrost, or something, some changes, very significant changes uh, occurred during this period of time. Formation of these uh, thaw lakes, or thermokars lakes. It was a kind of explosion of lakes in uh, uh, low lands, uh, which thermally permafrost is still stable there. However, uh, increasing in the uh, summer thaw, uh, reached this, this uh, very icy, uh, permafrost and this ice start turning into water settlement 
and collection of water develop this uh, thermokarst lake or thaw lakes. And that's, these lakes, they still there since then. So the most lakes on, on this Arctic lowlands were developed during this uh, Hudson Optimum. And they're still changing, some of them draining, some of them appearing anew, but the major uh, explosion of number of these lakes happened during that period of time, about, well, around 10 to uh, 7,000 years ago. So as a result, uh, if you look at this graph, this graph shows in the middle part is proxy for, uh, for temperature, for climate. Uh, so uh, past on the right, uh, present on the left, uh, but also two graphs. On the top is carbon dioxide concentration. And that's all from uh, ice cores uh, uh, interpretation, data from ice cores in Greenland. Uh, and the lower part is uh, methane concentration. And you see that climate and changes in very strong greenhouse gases uh, abundance in the atmosphere is very strongly correlated. So all this story, what, what I was uh, trying to, to, to show you, uh, give us some idea that at least part of this uh, increase in greenhouse gases during the warming period is, uh, is a result of permafrost dynamics. So during cold period of time, this uh, uh, material free, uh, freezing, uh, collecting organics, uh, uh, sequestered in the frozen state, decreasing uh, abundance of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. In a warm period of time, permafrost thaw and ice melting release this carbon again into the carbon cycle. And uh, as a result, uh, the in, uh, increase in, in uh, uh, CO2 and methane concentration in the atmosphere. So there's other mechanisms, of course, involved. But our point is, at least some of this uh, uh, pro process and results is the, the product of changes in permafrost. And some scientists believe that very significant part of this cycle is result of working of, of permafrost, developing and degrading of permafrost. Uh, so after this Hudson Optimum, uh, again, some proxy data showing that it was cooling. So last several thousand years generally was on the co colder side. And as a result, of course, permafrost reacted. And by now, uh, permafrost reoccupied a significant part of the land which was lost in, during the Hudson Optimum. So this is pretty much present day distribution of permafrost in, uh, in Northern Eurasia. And if climate, uh, of course, the shelves, they still underwater. Permafrost is thawing under those shelves, upper red colors. Um, but in the uh, lower part, uh, we have new uh, hard sand permafrost, which form down to maybe 50 to 100 meters during this period of time. And if climate will not change, that's pretty much what we have. Even with a little bit warmer climate right now than it was, say, 50 years ago, uh, and some permafrost is degrading already. It's still not, uh, we are still in a, in a climate which more or less uh, in uh, equilibrium, uh, permafrost is still in equilibrium with climate, except for some specific regions. So if climate will not change, uh, there will be some changes in permafrost, but not that really significant. However, we know that uh, projections of, of climate models uh, and specifically from IPCC report, showing that, that we should expect very significant changes in uh, warming in climate, especially in high latitudes, especially uh, up to seven degrees warming uh, during this century. That's what is projection. Of course, seven degrees warming is very significant number, very big number, because the coldest permafrost now in, in, in uh, Alaska is uh, warmer than minus 10. So you can imagine, uh, it's, it's, it's very significant. So to keep track of permafrost and its stability and how it's changed, uh, we are working, we are, uh, as permafrost community, working very hard uh, to monitor, to record 
uh, temperature in permafrost because temperature is one of the most straightforward parameter which you can measure and at the same time it shows the health of permafrost so if you have permafrost with minus five and lower that's pretty healthy and stable permafrost as soon as temperatures start to get to zero degrees celsius or 32 fahrenheit then you start to have some insta instability showing up and their permafrost is not healthy and in danger. So that's why we, uh, as a permafrost community, develop a program, actually it's international uh, program of thermal state of permafrost, where we measure temperature in many boreholes. Right now, after this uh, international polar year uh, was very um, helpful in this direction, we have about 850 uh, long-term borehole measurements which we hope to continue to measure in uh, Northern Hemi uh, well, it's actually global, and most of them in Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so this is an example of our um, system of, of deep boreholes where we measure temperature in Alaska. And um, typically it looked like we have some small med station there, and, and also we have borehole uh, this uh, cable in it and measure temperature. In this case, automatically, every hour. We don't have to measure in deep borehole temperature every hour, but because we measure it every hour uh, for uh, shallow uh, conditions, so we do the same in, in deeper borehole. And uh, this kind of data uh, provide us opportunity to look at the uh, changes in permafrost. And especially in Alaska, we were very fortunate because uh, Geophysical Institute uh, uh, by the lead uh, of uh, uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Thom, uh, Tom Osterkamp, developed this uh, transect of boreholes. Uh, he was very visionary, uh, and uh, he did it in the late 70s and early 80s. And now, uh, since then, temperature was recorded every year. So we have continuous records, a record of temperatures and permafrost since then. Uh, and now it's very unique data. It's very uh, unique not only for the uh, United States, for North America, but uh, for Russia as well. So it's one of the very, very valuable records. So now we can compare uh, present day conditions and future conditions, if these measurements will be continued in the future, uh, how permafrost behaves, what, what is, what, what, where it's going. And this is just one example, one borehole, a dead horse. Uh, it's one of the northern uh, borehole in, in this uh, transect. So. Uh, this record started by Tom in the uh, uh, early uh, 80s. And you see from there, in the 80s uh, was kind of, uh, so what we show here is so-called temperature profiles. So the temperature in Celsius on top, the depth on the, on the left. So uh, from 20 meters to 50 meters. So from roughly 60 feet to 150 feet. Um, so every year we record this temperature profile. And what we see in 80s, temperature was kind of uh, um, you know, varying in the, in, the, in the area of minus 8.5 at this side. And since late 80s, it's warming. It's warming so much that on uh, at 20 meters depth, which is 60 feet, we have uh, more than 2 degrees Celsius, more than 4 degrees Fahrenheit warming at this side in uh, permafrost temperature. And even at 50 meters, 150 feet, uh, more than that, we have uh, almost one degree Celsius warming. So this uh, definitely show that uh, the trend is warming in permafrost uh, in, in Alaska. And this is data from other sites on the uh, northern part of this transect, uh, starting with Vesdok, the coldest conditions. Uh, in the beginning of measurements, we had temperatures below minus 10. We don't have any more not from our boreholes, not from USGS boreholes. We don't have any uh, temperatures below 10, minus 10 degrees in permafrost anymore, anymore at the places we measure it. And then see that most of the changes happened during the 90s. In the 2000s, was kind of, um, there was increase, but very, very uh, small increase in, in, in uh, northern uh, sites and almost no, no increase in, in the Brooks Range uh, or, or uh, actually, it's uh, uh, northern foothills of the Brooks Range. And very recently, we start to see something uh, warming again. So it's very interesting. Every year, we go and add one more year of data. And it's very interesting to see what is where it's going on. And it seems like 
lately there is some acceleration of warming again after more or less more or less stable conditions uh, on the north slope during the uh, 2000s. So similar data from uh, interior Alaska showing uh, the same uh, kind of generally the same trend. However, uh, it's less in numbers. So see this uh, scale is different. It's from minus five to minus 0 0.5 to minus three Celsius. So the increase is less than a degree or a degree and a half mostly. But temperature is much closer to zero. And if <coughs> even in that horse temperature changed by four degrees or three degrees Celsius at the, at the top of the permafrost, it's still from uh, minus say nine to, to minus six or minus five. So minus five is still stable. So in interior Alaska, it's, uh, it's a little bit more worrisome because temperature is really closing to an instability range of, of permafrost temperatures towards the zero degrees Celsius. Another interesting feature here, uh, if you look carefully, you see that during the last several years, it is cooling somewhere there, at, at least at several sites like College Pit, Birch Lake, uh, Old Man, so it was a little bit of cooling. Of course, this cooling didn't bring back from first temperatures uh, from the beginning of, of these records. But it, it is some cooling, which is a kind of small cooling bump on a, on a uh, global warming trend. Uh, An explanation could be found from uh, our records from uh, air temperature on the bottom from Fairbanks, and uh, especially on snow, snow depth. So lately, we really have most of the, our uh, years or winters uh, uh, pretty low snow conditions. So that could explain this kind of local cooling of permafrost. But uh, the point is that just, just continue these records, we really can tell what is going on uh, right now and especially in comparison with what it was in the past. Uh, the results of these uh, efforts uh, brought this uh, snapshot, uh, thermal state of permafrost snapshot um, for northern hemisphere. I will show only two examples, one for uh, North America and another one for uh, northern Eurasia. And uh, so, of course, most of the data comes from Alaska and north uh, west Canada uh, because of lots of activities there. And what, if you look at the, the colors, show the temperature. So uh, again, uh, cold temperature now only, we can find it only in a high Arctic and high Canadian Arctic. Uh, th there's still some colder temperatures in the a, in a, uh, north slope of Alaska between minus five and, and 10, you know, minus 10. But if, if you go to uh, interior Alaska and the rest of Alaska, south from the Brooks Range, so most colors are orange and yellow. So most permafrost is you know, within less than uh, two degrees Celsius from the uh, point of, of thawing. So that's really uh, gives us idea that of stability, or e better to say instability of permafrost in the interior of, uh, of Alaska. There are still some locations where permafrost is uh, colder than minus two, even in the interior, but the most color are uh, orange and, and yellow, and red represents no permafrost already. And uh, it's normal because it's discontinuous permafrost zone. You can find permafrost and non-permafrost in the same area. So from Siberia, data from Siberia, uh, very interestingly similar to what we see in, uh, in Alaska. So major warming during the 90s, uh, late 80s and 90s, uh, a little bit of uh, not too much warming in 2000s at some places, some locations, and much uh, more warming in colder permafrost than in warmer permafrost. So that's uh, give us idea that these changes are not Alaska or Northwest uh, North America specific process. It is actually uh, at least hemispherical process. And the same data we have from, um, from uh, Nordic countries as well, showing pretty much the same, the same trends. And uh, putting it on the map uh, for northern Eurasia, uh, this, uh, the same idea with uh, colors, you see that, again, the colder permafrost is still only in the high, uh, high Arctic, high Russian Arctic. And even in the continuous permafrost, which kind of dark blue uh, background, you can start to see these this little uh, red uh, dots. It means that 
uh, permafrost is thawing, even in uh, southern part of continuous permafrost zone. It means that boundary between continuous and discontinuous permafrost is moving up north. And uh, we have few examples, few examples where we're recording thawing permafrost. And this is one of the sites in uh, uh, western Siberia where it shows development of, uh, of thawing of permafrost during the last uh, 40 years at some locations the top of permafrost lowered down by several meters, sometimes up to eight meters uh, during these 40 years. And not only already existing, uh, we call it talix, uh, developing deeper and deeper, but also in the upper uh, graph showing that permafrost up to beginning of 90s was more or less stable, and then it started to rapidly uh, degrading. Uh, at this location. So not so many locations in natural conditions, again, natural conditions without any disturbances, it's just a result of climate change, uh, we have on degradation of permafrost because uh, it's not that widespread yet, but we probably can expect that it will happen more and more often in, in the future if these projections of climate change um, uh, will you know, show that uh, they make sense. So now, <coughs> what we can say about, about the future? Uh, well, to, we can use this, all this information that we have to make our models a little bit kind of less uncertain. That's only what we can hope, because models is models. So like somebody said, all models are wrong. Some of them could be useful. Right? <laughs> so, uh, we hope that our models are useful. Well, <laughs> uh, so we do some modeling work, and uh, I will show some results of this modeling with some scenario of climate development. Of course, there is many different scenarios you can choose from. Uh, we choose some uh, intermediate, so not too cold future uh, climate, not too warm, somewhere in the middle. So if you follow this, this permafrost. So this is recent day permafrost distribution in the northern hemisphere. So by mid-century, this old red area is uh, showing uh, uh, thawing of permafrost. Not just warming, all permafrost will be warming, but at these locations, permafrost will be already thawing from the top down in most of the locations. Again, of course, the scale of this map is pretty bad. Uh, and there will be some places where permafrost will still stable in this zone. But as a general trend, that's the area which will be affected by widespread permafrost degradation. And by the end of the century, that's uh, projections gives us that more than half of recent day, more or less stable permafrost will be degrading on this scale uh, by the end of the century. So we did some work with a higher resolution for Alaska. Uh, using the same type of modeling and fit these uh, models with our data. And that I will present some, some results. So we'll start with uh, present day conditions. Uh, red is uh, thawing permafrost, blue is, well, more or less stable, and whitish is very unstable. It, uh, it's already going something uh, is there. So next several decades, two decades, actually showing not, not too much warming, especially this recent decade. It's very interesting how these uh, uh, models can produce this kind of uh, time climate models, but it's a different topic of, of presentation. We'll just, we just believe in what, what uh, climate models uh, produce and use it as input data for our models. But uh, after that, in 20s and 30s and 40s, especially by mid-century, lots of area in uh, uh, south from Yukon River generally and some places north of it will be, permafrost will be degrading widespread. And then by the end of the century uh, we can expect, well if this model and climate models are correct, that pretty much all permafrost south from Brooks Range mostly except for some areas in, in the interior, permafrost will be thawing, actively thawing from the top down. Well, what, what's the consequences of that? There's many, many consequences, and we can talk uh, a lot about it. But altogether, I think at this point, the, the major two which we have to pay attention are, are two of them. So effect of degrading permafrost on carbon cycle 
and on uh, uh, permafrost change as societal impact. And I will cover a little bit both of them, but I don't have really too much time to talk about. Uh, but I will give you some examples. So let's start with carbon cycle. Uh, remember I said that we believe that during that long period of time, uh, f development and degrading of permafrost has something to, um, um, to give to these changes in greenhouse gas concentration. So we still believe in that. And if you look at the uh, material which is, which is thawing, uh, now, at, uh, say here, thawing is going on because of the erosion. It's not necessarily climate warming, but erosion. However, if look, looking at the material, we see that uh, this permafrost, uh, uh, the, the soil, uh, frozen soil, uh, contained up to sometimes 10% of carbon in it. And of course, uh, this huge amount of carbon returning back into the carbon cycle will produce uh, significant amount of uh, greenhouse gases or carbon dioxide or methane or others uh, and that could be uh, comparable with what uh, say the, the, the activities of, of uh, people human activities are producing right now in, in form of uh, burning uh, fossil fuels um, very important to know which one, uh, which, which way it will go, or methane. If uh, uh, it will be wetter conditions, this uh, decomposition of this organic matter will produce methane, and drier conditions will be mostly th uh, CO2. Here it's some uh, couple examples of effect of thawing permafrost on, on surface hydrology. So you can have this uh, thawing permafrost actually both uh, wetting and drying depending where you are, what is the soil type, what is the uh, topography, what is drainage conditions generally. In bad drainage conditions, like this example of Tanana Flats, a degrading permafrost develop uh, bogs and boreal forests turning into bogs. So this is a photo by uh, Tor Jorgensen. And you can see it flying to Fairbanks, you know, when you go approaching uh, airport, you see this dying trees, there are dying birch trees. Uh, and that's because in the past, during the Little Ice Age, uh, it was permafrost there, and uh, surface was much higher because of ice in the permafrost brought it up. Uh, conditions were nice, trees were growing. Now, because of uh, warming, actually, uh, these permafrost start to degrade and go back to, to bogs. And trees, which were developed during this nice period of time, now sorry, but you can't do anything about it. So that's that's way where thawing permafrost make it, uh, conditions wetter. Uh, other scenario where you have well-drained conditions like uh, sandy soils, uh, higher in elevation, better drainage conditions, thawing of permafrost will lead to drying. Uh, for in this example is where permafrost degraded, at least from the surface down to several meters, in an area affected by fire in central uh, Siberia, uh, West Siberia, East, I'm sorry, East, East Siberia, near Kuria, uh, the soils conditions and topography uh, prevent uh, development of forest again because conditions became too dry for the forest. And forest is changing in, uh, from a boreal forest to into steppe, kind of like uh, grass, grassland conditions. So this example shows that degradation of permafrost can do both drying and, and wetting. Uh, this is uh, um, from Kenji Yoshikawa example. Uh, there is more local effects of thawing permafrost. Uh, remember this big ice wedges what I showed before? So now if permafrost is thawing, these ice wedges will turn, uh, well, melt and turn into water. Surface will subside, collect water. This water will warm up again. So it's kind of positive feedback and eventually development of uh, thermocarst lake or thaw lake. And that's a very typical process, which, like I said, the most actively was developing during the Hudson Opium. But now, this new wave of warming, uh, this uh, process getting more and more uh, active again. So it starts with small depressions like this, and then it turned into, into thermocarst lakes. And these thermocarst lakes producing lots of methane. So there is lots of work was done by the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, Katie Walder specifically, and colleagues, showing that it's re really a significant source of methane, all these thaw lakes in, in the uh, area of uh, permafrost. 
So that's very important part in the recent day uh, carbon cycle. Slow processes uh, also uh, trigger uh, some degradation of permafrost and uh, again involvement of carbon uh, from the frozen state into back into carbon cycle and producing uh, um, producing uh, greenhouse gases. This example from Banks Island and the Canadian Archipelago, and uh, this is one of this very uh, picture I like, this kind of uh, slide of uh, upper soil develop this kind of carpet uh, fog uh, feature, very interesting. But what is going on after that, this, uh, uh, it will develop this small thermocarst lake, and this is already north slope of Alaska, and you see the water is very brownish. There's lots of carbon there, and it smells like in the permafrost tunnel. I don't know if you were in permafrost tunnel. It smells pretty badly right there in open air. So lots of carbon, again, from that sequestered state in permafrost returning back into, into carbon cycle and uh, emitting as, a, as a greenhouse gases. And just to show what is the scale, I mean, the process is understandable, but if it's important, well, if you look at the recent estimates, and it's also a result of activities of permafrost community during the international polar year, there is estimates how much carbon is sequestered now in the permafrost uh, area. So it's about uh, 1,000 gigaton of carbon in the upper three meters, and another 650 gigaton in the deeper permafrost. Just for comparison, uh, it's about the number, about 700 gigaton is now in the atmosphere. So in, a, in this permafrost conditions with frozen uh, carbon is actually uh, twice more of the carbon in the frozen state right now, uh, which we know about, uh, compared to the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. So if all this carbon will be released, which is, of course, a very not possible scenario, but if uh, the concentration of uh, carbon dioxide could be actually tripled in, in, the, in the atmosphere. Well, of course, it's, it's probably not a possible scenario. And then there's even deeper sources of carbon, and not just carbon, but maybe methane and gas hydrates and all this kind of uh, huge amount of, of carbon sequestered in the permafrost and the deeper permafrost and under permafrost, which uh, uh, very, you know, not good estimates at all, and uh, several order of magnitude uh, range estimates but the amount of this carbon could be even larger than, than in the upper uh, permafrost. So that's another uh, source which uh, probably will be involved in, in a much slower way than its upper, uh, upper permafrost carbon, but eventually it could be, it became a player, significant player in carbon cycle. So that's uh, all about carbon now, societal impacts. Uh, and well, I don't have too much time, but I have uh, lots of interesting pictures to show, and mostly it will be pictures, actually. So, again, uh, the, the major thing is ice in the permafrost, uh, specifically massive ice. So this is example from uh, Fox area in Fairbanks, so, uh, nor, uh, north from Fairbanks. Uh, so this is a big ice wedges. Again, if somebody uh, had a chance to visit a permafrost tunnel, we could see this ice wedges from inside. So this is from... Uh, uh, some some cliff. Uh, and this is ice is is ice wedge. You're looking along the ice wedge here, so it's still lots of ice there in uh, in many areas around Fairbanks. Uh, some of this ice already melted in in the recent past, and uh, when it happened, then this ecosystem uh, sitting on this very icy permafrost just collapsed. And this is a good example, this uh, Kenji Yoshikawa is uh, for scale. Uh, this uh, thermocarst developments in, again, the same area. Uh, so you can see uh, it's, uh, the forest practically destroyed when, when it happened. Uh, if ice uh, wedges close to the ground, uh, you see this kind of effect. And this is, you know, you, you, you know it's Balain uh, Road uh, uh, bicycle pass, very fun to ride ride this bicycle pass. Uh, and, and they tried to fix it, you know, more or less uh, periodically, but it, it turned back to the same conditions. Because this ice wedge is close to the surface, when they start to, to melt ice, 
uh, the, where ice wedge is, subsidence is much larger than in between ice wedges. Remember the first, one of the first slides I showed from the, looking from the top, that ice wedges develop in some kind of, uh, some polygons. So if you cross these polygons, you, and uh, ice will, in wedges will start to melt, you will have this kind of topography or microtopography. So ice uh, melts and surface subsides uh, in ice wedges, but, but in between there's much less ice. So you have this kind of uh, fun to, to ride. And also along the um, farmer's, uh, farmer's loop uh, bicycle pass in some places, you can see similar things. So it's pretty much a similar place. This tree is leaning, it fell down some time ago, so it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, even in the, in, not in the bicycle pass, it's on another side of Belain Road. It's a snowmobile, uh, a snow machine pass, uh, showing the same, the same feature. Again, lots of fun, I think, to ride. Um, and it, you see that uh, it's this degrading, degradation of this ice wedge is triggered by, by Belain Road. So it's not uh, uh, global warming, really. But if you look, these this kind of troughs, they're going into the forest already. So there is some developments in the forest already, which are uh, not directly impacted by, by this road. Uh, if ice, big mass ice, as chunks of ice, are deeper in the ground, uh, they could, uh, this ice could melt sometimes ago, say 10, 20 years ago, developing some voids under some soil on the top. And these voids can, can be preserved for, for a while, and maybe for many years. However, uh, these voids were developed on, uh, on these ice wedges. And remember, they're all developing this, this kind of network. So they're all connected. So the voids, not just simple uh, you know, hole in the middle of the ground, but it's in the form of channels. And water can move through these channels. And water can increase this, this volume of, of voids. And eventually, sooner or later, the surface collapse, and that's, we very well know, uh, sinkholes. Sinkholes around uh, Fairbanks, it's, it's typical, especially in the spring when there's lots of water there. So this one is a sinkhole on, uh, uh, along the, the uh, Goldstream Road. Uh, and uh, it's pretty deep. Well, I'm trying to reach with shovel, but it's about two meters, so six feet deep, and sometimes even deeper. And the most interestingly, the loss of water in spring coming in this, uh, in this sinkhole, and the level doesn't increase. It's water really draining somewhere. So this water it will not collect and will not fill this, this, this deep or sinkhole because of this connection. So it will drain somewhere. Uh, it will be interesting to make experiment and see where it comes out of, of the ground. Uh, and there are some, there are some ideas about, but probably people who live down slope will not appreciate these ideas. You know, put some kind of radiative material there and see where it goes. <laughs> um, radioactive. And, and this is right on the shoulder of, of uh, Goldstream Road. One hole appeared like this. And again, you see water coming in and disappearing. Like this. So, of course, all this process will affect infrastructure. And again, uh, infrastructure itself is huge, has huge impact on permafrost without any kind of uh, warming of climate. However, uh, it's all happening on the background of kind of background temperatures. If background temperatures of permafrost higher, this, uh, this process could develop uh, more easily. Um, and this is just a few examples, uh, most of them from, from Russia. Uh, starting from the uh, top left, uh, this building it was never actually occupied by people because it was built on half permafrost non and half non-permafrost conditions without any precaution. And by the time it was almost completed, uh, permafrost uh, thawed and the one portion uh, moved down about uh, two meters, or not two meters, but about a meter and a half, so about three feet, uh, I'm sorry, uh, five feet uh, down and it was you know, crack in the middle, and of course it was never uh, occupied by people, so it was just demolished. Uh, pipelines uh, in Russia affected by erosion and because of thawing permafrost without any precaution was uh, built in, in a hurry in the uh, uh, 70s and 80s. Um, lower right is from Chersky. Uh, this interesting building, uh, uh, the first some cracks appeared on the walls, 
and in in less than a week, in less just few days, whole section of this house just collapsed. Of course, uh, uh, people had time to leave, but if you look carefully, there are some belongings that were still there, so not everything was removed from it. From it. And uh, result, well, the the this collapse was a result of thawing of permafrost. The thawing of permafrost was not if, uh, really 100% triggered by, well, even less than that, uh, by warming, but by leaking hot water in the basement of the building. So it's, 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 it's bad maintenance uh, practices. It's not climate change. However, it's good uh, kind of demonstration what will happen to buildings with w even good uh, practices but with disappearing permafrost. So you can still have some problems here. And finally, on the, on the right uh, uh, up corner, that's here. It's, uh, it's a uh, bag parking lot at the Geophysical Institute and Arctic Research Center. So Westridge, Westridge, uh, northern parking lot. And I have a whole story about this parking lot, so I will show you briefly. So whole history I demonstrated. I called it um, University versus permafrost. So <laughs> who will prevail? So it started in, in June 2000. So a new building was uh, built just recently, uh, this International Arctic Research Center on the right, Geophysical Institute on the left, and big parking lot on the place, which was small, very small gravel parking lot of the Geophysical Institute. So most of this, this part was forest. So it was cleared, uh, and leveled, and uh, put asphalt. So small holes appeared like this. First it was kind of well holes, not so much problem. But the same year, later in July, uh, suddenly the surface collapsed and developed a huge uh, sinkhole there. And I heard a story from, uh, from one of my students that uh, he, he was uh, at the fire department that time, and they brought a truck of, full of water and dumped this hole just to look uh, how big it is, and the old water disappeared without any any <laughs> any any traces. <laughs> so uh, they helped to to further process probably as well. Um, so now, interestingly, that in uh, 2003, uh, new project started right there. Um, that uh, now is uh, Verb uh, West Ridge Research Building, and uh, um, when the con contractor start digging this pit, uh, I will come, you know, more or less periodically and say, did you see any holes there? Then they said, no, we don't need any holes here. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> so anyway, when they were digging far enough from the geophysical institute towards the forest, they eventually, on the uh, right lower corner, they discovered this hole. A uh, hole which is kind of like tunnel going somewhere or and uh, uh, so people start to a little bit worry about it, but they're still digging. Uh, and uh, the, the same holes appeared on another side of the, of the pit as well. This is uh, Professor Yuri Shur uh, looking at this hole. And it's very interesting. You look at this hole and you see these tunnels. They all connected and it goes somewhere far, far, far. So it's really interconnected tunnels. It's not just voids. Well, digging uh, farther, they found ice, finally. I, first it was just small piece, and then suddenly, boom, it's all ice wedge, nice ice wedge, uh, about uh, three meters or more in uh, width, and going somewhere down. So at this point, there was some kind of, um, well, not panic, but some. <laughs> so they stopped digging and, and drill more holes to look what is that. And after this drilling, they said, well, it's just a small piece of ice. Uh, we will just dig it out, and, and everything will be good. That's the they did. So 2003. By the end of you know, 2003, um, this uh, pit was completed. And in August, the uh, building started to, to turn some, uh, getting some shapes already. Well, in August, right above this ice wedge, the new collapse appeared right there, right next to the to the wall. Um, and if you look, it's pretty much the, the same the same feature. So they look pretty much the same. Typical sinkhole going down uh, six, eight, uh, sometimes even deeper feet. Um, well, it it was filled with material and 
war was there, and so far it's, it's okay. Um, however, in May 2004, some new holes, you remember these holes, just looking very innocent at first, <laughs> start to appear on the, on the wall towards the forest, and of course, so, soon enough, the new sinkhole uh, developed. Uh, and it's nice, see, this picture was made from practically from my office, so it's very easy to monitor this, <laughs> this thing. So, so, of course, immediately some several trucks, many trucks, uh, this growl came and, and filled this hole and everything was good. Uh, but in 2006, <laughs> another hole appeared. So fortunately, farther, so it, it seems like a university is winning here, right? <laughs> <laughs> So it's moving farther into the forest. Well, who cares about forest? There's some small buildings there, but it's... Uh, and also, uh, sorry, also at the very first one, very first hole I showed, exactly the same location, new hole appeared again, 2006. Well, you can see this settlement right on the, on the parking lot. And you can trace, if you look uh, from high enough, you see this polygonal shape of this, of this truss. So it is uh, melting ice there, melting ice wedges, and settlement will continue. Uh, well, uh, so far, uh, yeah. uh, it was 2006. If you look now, it looks pretty good because there was some money was spent and, and uh, parking lot was fixed. However, um, with especially with warming, further warming, you should expect this story, uh, universal versus uh, permafrost, will continue. And, and I promise I will, I will as, as far as I am there, I will keep, keep uh, recording this. And just last few slides here uh, on other, m maybe more serious topic. Uh, with all this warming and thawing, projected thawing of permafrost, by the end of the century, some uh, many villages in, uh, especially in no Northwest um, of Alaska, will be affected of this uh, widespread thawing of permafrost. Uh, and practically uh, Kivalino, Point Hope, and many other villages there uh, will turn from more or less stable permafrost now, which is about minus three degrees Celsius, to thawing permafrost by then. Uh, it's already, uh, the, at least 12 villages was, uh, have big major problem with erosion, coastal erosion, both uh, ocean coast and river banks. And uh, at least 12 of them already have some plans for relocation. But with relocation, it's another problem, where to relocate. Uh, permafrost is around, so how to, how to solve this problem. But other problems uh, related to uh, water supply. So many villages in the, in the northwest, uh, again, uh, use or rivers or uh, lakes for water supply. And this uh, further uh, degradation of permafrost, we start more and more see this uh, very significant coastal uh, uh, erosion or banks erosion on, on the rivers, where again, uh, if you look at the, uh, this uh, uh, right uh, low corner, uh, this icy and also uh, carbon-rich permafrost is thawing, supplying this, uh, this sediments with something which you don't, don't know even what is there, chemically and biologically, <laughs> really, into water, which uh, it's a, um, and it, it's a, and a, uh, Willow, uh, uh, Willow River and uh, which supply uh, water for Kivalina. And also this uh, slides or, or development of probably possible solution as well to be sure that, that uh, because uh, uh, there is permafrost as well under the building, it was, but it was not icy at all. So it seems like that permafrost thawed sometimes in the past and then uh, refreezing, it didn't get any, any significant amount of ice there. So the problem only the very, very far north, north corner. But so far, it seems like it's, uh, it's pushing into the forest, which, like I said, maybe a university is winning in terms of building, but parking lot, of course, will, will be a problem for a while. This is in regards to the uh, remote lakes or whatever. I live in a very remote lake. And so it's actually a two-front process. With the melting permafrost, you can have the uh, silt and other things or polluting the water that we drink. And also, the lake could find one of those channels and go away suddenly because we've seen a huge right. drop right. in our water. 
uh, over the years, and everyone's kind of, some people say from the 64 earthquake, but it's been even more dramatic. And I'm not believing the earthquake thing where it opened a channel. I think now it's, it's yeah. perm. well, what do you do? Yeah. You could do like the university, just bring truckloads in <laughs> of dirt? No well, well, first of all, I think you, ha you have to get more information on, uh, on specific you know, location, specific lake, how stable it is. And you can use some, some methods, remote sensing, to look what lakes are doing around it, uh, what is, do some analysis and see if any chance that uh, there is some channel where a lake can drain, what is topography. There is some way to predict uh, how stable this lake is. Of course, warming in uh, water temperature, you cannot do too much, and development of some uh, algae and all, all these you know, uh, creatures there, it's, it's very difficult to do. So you will still have some problem with quality of water, but at least uh, you can predict if lake will be stay there uh, or you have some problems in the near future. Well, this was Lake Minchumina, and you dudes were out there a while ago. Um, we had Russian people out, and they were doing some measurements. It was a few years ago. You were helicoptered in. Were you one of them or no? No. Oh. Oh, it was some I'm Russian, but not those <laughs> ones. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, it's a major problem. It could be you know, larger because the 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 rate of uh, lake uh, disappearance is is very worrisome. Yeah. I was surprised to see the, or hear the mention of Kazakhstan and then the Nepal plateau permafrost issues. Are they similar to the things you were talking about here today, or is it a different kind yeah. of geographical issue? Yeah, it's, uh, it's mountain permafrost, so it's pretty uh, much different in, in general. So it's uh, much more diverse and variable in space. Uh, lots of bedrock, which doesn't care if it's above zero or below zero. However, there is some very interesting other problems uh, which actually can help people a little bit. So you, you know that from this area, the problem is also fresh water. And most of this fresh water is coming from uh, glaciers. And this glacier is very, very rapidly disappearing in this area, especially in, uh, in the Central Asia. Uh, and uh, um, not in, in uh, uh, Himalayas yet, but in Central Asia it's getting real problem because uh, it directly uh, relates to fresh water source. So now uh, having permafrost there, it's, it could help. It will not help a lot. I mean, it will help a lot, but for a short period of time. So uh, throwing permafrost with lots of ice in it can, for some period of time, uh, fit this this uh, this uh, uh, streams of, of fresh water from the mountains but it's also very limited. It's uh, maybe even more limited than, than glaciers. So in this case, they're very interested in permafrost in terms of source of fresh water. In alpine permafrost in Alps, there is another problem with, uh, with uh, hazards, geological hazards, because throwing permafrost, uh, uh, again, the, the, this uh, holding capacity of the material de degrade immediately after thawing and developing all kind of slides, uh, rock falls, all kind of things. And because it's a high, highly populated area uh, compared to Himalayas, so that's uh, every event is hazard, every. And of course, some uh, uh, tourist industry all kind of affected. So they have all, all you know, looking very carefully on um, permafrost development and invest lots of money, actually, in, in the monitoring system in, in uh, in Alps. Another question. Thank you. Just had a question building on the previous one as far as earthquakes. How was how are earthquakes included in the modeling and what happens in some of the different um, environments when an earthquake happens as far as the water percolating up and where does the water go? Um, and if, it, if that has any implications for Fairbanks. Yeah, well, uh, it's not in the model, I can tell immediately. And it's probably something which we will get to uh, much later than, than we uh, will try to include something else <laughs> in the model. So they really, uh, so far, developed very kind of, well, I wouldn't say primitive, uh, otherwise I will kind of shoot my, my uh, leg or whatever. But <clears throat> so earthquakes are, uh, has some um, 
some in engineering consequences in terms of stability of soil, especially if uh, in permafrost regions uh, there uh, could be conditions where uh, soils is oversaturated. In this case, of course, the, uh, the, uh, there can be a cumulative effect and amplifying of earthquake in these locations. So this is a very interesting problem. We are not dealing with this one at all. So uh, it, it's a very interesting topic. We just don't have capacity to, to answer these questions. Um, but in terms of kind of general permafrost conditions, of course, earthquake is minor factor. Thank you. Um, I understand that last night DOT had a um, information hearing on a road to Nome, and so I was paying attention to your maps there, figuring out where Nome was. And in your opinion, does it make sense financially to build and maintain a road across that discontinuous permafrost? Um, well, I think so. Without roads, it's very difficult to live. You know. uh, it will cost, and it will cost more farther we go. So probably my recommendation will be build now because later it will be even more <laughs> expensive to build. <laughs> I think we have one last question here in the back. So on that road to Nome. <laughs> Sorry, hold on a second. Anyway, on the road to Nome, would, because I know they've um, they started using styrofoam and road bases to basically have the, the road actually float on, uh, sit on the styrofoam, which actually um, allows it to basically float on top of the soil. So that way, I mean, would that be a useful op um, solution for the permafrost, or would it be kind of pointless because of the basically sinkholes that would develop yeah. along the road? Well, well of, course, of course, the major thing is how much ice in there. That's, that's the first question to answer. And of course, it would, if possible, any uh, ice reach permafrost, which is impossible, and uh, somewhere you have to cross this, this you know, bad conditions. But building a uh, practice of building without disturbances, or minimal disturbances, of course you cannot build without disturbances, but minimal disturbances, and putting this insulative material will actually help, because what you do, you reduce the heat flux into the ground, and you postpone, and sometimes a lot, postponing this process of thawing of permafrost. Of course, with all um, warmer climate, uh, you will start to see some side effects. And permafrost, maybe you can preserve permafrost right under the road uh, using all kinds of engineering solutions. But permafrost around the world uh, uh, road will start to, to thaw and start to develop all kinds of processes, these uh, sinkholes or slow processes it always has to be you know, taken into consideration in engineering design. But like I said, I mean, engineering design is developed well enough to, to do it and solve problems. The question is how much, I mean, how expensive it will be. That's, that's the question. Thank you. Will you all join me in applauding and thanking Dr. Romanovsky one last time? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming out tonight. <laughs>